Thanks. All right, hello everyone, and welcome to the Future of Diplomacy Projects event, uh, Rebuilding Ukraine, the Seizure of Russian Assets. My name is Ilya Tevchenko, and I'm a master's in public policy student here at the Harvard Kennedy School, a Belfort Young Leader Student Fellow and Chair of the Ukraine Caucus here at HKS. I'd like to welcome both our in-person and virtual guests. For those of you in the Zoom room, feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box. Today, we have three stellar panelists. We are joined by 71st U.S. Treasury Secretary, Dr. Lawrence Summers, the White Burkett Miller Professor of History at the University of Virginia, Dr. Philip Zelko, and former Assistant U.S. Secretary of State, Stephen Rademacher. The conversation will be moderated by Ambassador Paula Dabransky, Senior Fellow with the Future of Diplomacy Project and former U.S. Undersecretary of State for Global Affairs. They will discuss a crucial topic of today's geopolitics, the seizure of Russia's $300 billion in assets in the midst of Russia's brutal war against Ukraine. The economic toll of Russia's unprovoked attack is staggering. It has caused anywhere between $350 billion to more than $1 trillion in direct and indirect economic damages, and the numbers will only continue to grow. These costs are enormous. And as both Professor Summers and Professor Zelko have argued in the recent Washington Post article, applying the debtor's funds to pay its debts is a common way to encourage a settlement. Today's speakers will discuss the various possible mechanisms, legal measures, and incentives of how the U.S. can freeze Russia's assets and apply them for the reconstruction of Ukraine. Please warmly welcome today's guests. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ilya. Let me make sure I move this up so I can be well heard. Thank you so much, Ilya. And uh, I'd like to welcome as well our very distinguished panel. And if the three of you don't mind, I'm going to call you by your first name, Larry, Phil, and Steve. So Larry, welcome to you. I'm going to go to you first. You know, the core question that is really out there Essentially, what is the legal implication or argumentation of seizing Russian state assets? Um, and the fact that they are state assets, you know, how does this create a major challenge? Does it? And if so, how do we overcome it? I thought we'd hear from you first. Then I'd like to hear same question from Phil and then uh, from Steve. So over to you and welcome. So, Paula, I'm glad the Kennedy School and the Future of Diplomacy Project is hosting this, and I'm very glad to be joined uh, by my fellow uh, panelists. I stand out among those participating in this um, debate by virtue of not having any legal training. And so I am going to be careful about uh, expressing legal opinions, which you can get with both more authority more and more uh, expertise uh, from others. But I'd start by saying that one of the things that one has any, that one learns if one has any continuing involvement with uh, lawyers is that the law is not like a traffic light where things are either go or stop. There is often matters of substantial ambiguity. And then it becomes a policy judgment how hard to push uh, that ambiguity. And I think it is fair to say that on a whole variety of matters of uh, international law, countries take aggressive uh, positions. And certainly on matters of domestic law, countries take um, assertive uh, positions. It's not my impression that the Biden administration would have acted as it has with respect to student loan issues if it had sought the most conservative available legal advice, or if it had allowed itself to be extremely alarmed by the prospect that some court would decide to strike down uh, its judgment. 
So the first thing I would say is I think it's better to think of this as being a spectrum and as being than as being an absolute matter of uh, right and wrong. Second thing I would do is just remind everybody that uh, the stakes here are very, very large. This is one of the rare things, rare cases, where the highly expedient thing to do is also, I believe, the right uh, thing uh, to do. It's surely politically expedient to say that necessary economic support for Ukraine should come from Russian state assets rather than uh, from American and European taxpayers. It's also, I believe, the right thing to do in terms of servicing foreign policy objectives. Uh, it's the right thing to do because the sense that those resources are going to be deployed increases our scope for diplomacy when uh, the time uh, comes with respect to both Russia and Ukraine and third parties. It's the right thing to do because if it comes to be an established precedent that if your country launches so wanton aggression, that your head of state is deemed globally to be a war criminal, that that's a situation where seized assets are likely not just to be temporarily seized, but to be used uh, to uh, support and to meet the debts for those who have uh, been uh, hurt in uh, the context of the conflict. And I guess I conclude by just making uh, this point. I think there has been a tendency for this issue to be framed in terms of the traditional law of sanctions. And I'm not sure that's the right paradigm through which this should be viewed, rather than through uh, the context of war and through the context of debtors' obligations. It seems to me that if President Putin is a war criminal, that the Russian state has a liability of compensation for the damage that it has done uh, in Ukraine and quite possibly to other third parties. And so it seems to me that that obligation of compensation needs uh, to uh, be met and that if Russia is not meeting that obligation voluntarily, which I think we can safely assume that they are not, that the use of available collateral to assure that that obligation is met becomes appropriate and that that constitutes a uh, legal uh, basis. There may be prudential considerations involved in distinguishing between actions supported by the UN Security Council and actions supported by the UN General Assembly with uh, the use of its extraordinary power to act when the Security Council is unable to. But that is not a distinction enshrined into international uh, law. So it seems to me precedent from World War II, from Russia's own uh, actions from Iraq, combined with uh, the proper interpretation of the nature of this event, combined with uh, the strong case uh, to say that we should be pushing very hard forward on this issue. All right, well, thank, thank you very much for that very comprehensive answer. And I'm glad you took it.
and actually expanded my point uh, because I think you've laid a very strong foundation as to what the compelling ar arguments are and not just the sole and singular legal argument. Phil, let's go to you. Let's hear your response and you can take it in the similar direction or dive into the legal component. So first of all, um, I'm really glad you put this session together. I'm glad uh, you've got some people in front of you in the room, and I think, I hope uh, some people watching online. Here's why I'm glad. Because for most people reading the title of this session or hearing about this issue, they're bored. Because to the world, economics war is exciting, economics is boring. Now, this is kind of like uh, the six-year-olds on the soccer field where everyone runs to the ball. Um, and then when you get older, you learn actually that there's more to soccer than that. For people who learn about war from watching war movies, the battlefield stuff is exciting and leopard tanks dominate the headlines. So what we're talking about today is more important than 5,000 leopard tanks. What we're talking about today is probably where the war will actually be decided. And it, there may be a stalemate on the battlefield and if the Ukrainian economy continues to collapse and its private sector disintegrates, the game's gonna be over later this year. I hope I'm making myself clear because I don't think this issue is getting a fraction of the attention that it deserves to get and people ought to get hot about it. So that's point one. I try not to let my, my, any of my own personal frustration leak into my cool and dispassionate remarks. <laughs> Point two, I wanna, I wanna follow up on what Larry said about the sanctions paradigm. It turns out I have in my possession, the European Commission staff lawyer paper that was circulated about this issue last week and which was discussed in a working group in Brussels yesterday. So I actually am pretty up to date on their legal position. Their legal position is this is a sanctions paradigm. So I don't know how many people in the audience here have ever taken a course in international law, which is actually really important. So in a sanctions paradigm, you, you implement sanctions without breaking international law. You do things that are, little, in other words, I can freeze Russian assets but because I have ordinary international obligations to respect the immunity of those assets, I can't seize those assets and transfer them. So a sanctions paradigm allows me to freeze, but it doesn't allow me to transfer. That's a sanctions paradigm. You see, it's kind of a temporary thing in which, and there are versions of this in trade sanctions and other things. That's a sanctions paradigm. That's in international law. That's where the European Commission staff lawyers are right now. The paradigm that we have been in arguing about this now for a year in print is another paradigm, but it's also a legitimate paradigm in international law. It's called the international law of state countermeasures. So remember, sanctions, countermeasures. Now, if you were to look up the standard codifications of the international law of state countermeasures, all the international professors and scholars agree that actually the countermeasures paradigm is quite different from the sanctions paradigm. How is it different? When you do a, a legitimate state countermeasure, you are allowed to do things that would ordinarily be unlawful under international law. I can break Russia's immunity in its assets, which ordinarily I could not do because that is considered a legitimate countermeasure in cases where there is a serious breach of a peremptory norm of international law, which this case abundantly is. And then there are some procedural prerequisites, which actually have now been completely satisfied. So actually from the point of view of the international law of state countermeasures, this is not a close case. This is like right down the center of the strike zone. But it's, it's really interesting to me that now, even though that's, that point has been clear, I think partly because why haven't they used the international law of state countermeasures? Why haven't they stressed this? I think actually it's because of a simple sense of like, whoa, that, 
That would be a big deal. This generation hasn't gone there before. My generation, however, has gone there before. I, I have gone there before. I was working in the White House during the Gulf War, during the last similarly brazen international aggression when Iraq conquered Kuwait in August and September of 1990, and the international community got together and it did countermeasures. And what did it do with the countermeasures? It took all of Iraq state assets and transferred them. <laughs> but that happened um, uh, more than 30 years ago. And the current generation of lawyers didn't experience that personally as I did. And so I think they just kind of looked at this and this is, this is one more sanctions regime, like all the sanctions regimes we've been doing our whole working lives. And the other stuff kind of seemed strange and untested and foreign ground to them, but it's not. Uh, the Iraq precedent is actually perfectly on point. We did the countermeasures, there we are. By the way, question, do you need a court decision for this? No. Do you need a new UN resolution for this? No. All you need is a, a, a clear finding from, uh, from a third party source that there has been a serious breach of a peremptory norm of international law, like say waging aggressive war. Well, you've got that from the United Nations multiple times. You've got that from the International Court of Justice too. So you've got the finding of the, of the, of the serious breach. You've got Russia put on notice of a desire to get compensation for this breach. That was in the November 2022 UN resolution, which also gave Russia the opportunity to comply with its duty to compensate that Larry outlined. In other words, both substantively and procedurally, all the prerequisites have now been set for countermeasures that would transfer these assets. By the way, you'll notice I keep using the word transfer I actually don't think you should use the word seizure because that implies the United States takes these assets and makes them US property. We never did that for the Iraqi case. We never made the Iraqi assets US government property. We transferred them to an escrow account. And in that escrow account, they are reserved for transfer to further accounts in accordance with a compensation process. By the way, there is further precedence to this when Iran took our people hostage. Um, we froze all the Iranian assets. And then um, when, we, when our people were returned, what we did is we then took all those Iranian state assets and gold bullion, and we transferred it to an escrow account held by the Bank of England. Uh, it didn't, it, and then it got disposed of in accordance with international law, not domestic law. So there are some other issues and there are some other legal issues having to do with domestic legal authorities and do you need legislation? And we can get into that, but the details there get a little more technical. What I wanted to do just, as, just to start off is number one, say, folks, this is actually super important. It's more important than anything you'll read about the battlefield this week or the, maybe this month. And second, that the fundamental problem here is that most of the international community and its lawyers have slid into a familiar sanctions paradigm and have uh, forgotten or quailed before the prospect of applying an actually quite well-established paradigm of state countermeasures in a situation as enormous and grave as this one for the reasons Larry explained. Bill, thank you for making those important distinctions. Uh, especially because I think some of the use of other words essentially uh, comes down to those who don't want to see this go forward and literally setting up barriers that are non-existent. So, so thank you for that. Let's go to Steve. Steve, if you'll take on the same question for this moment. And also, Phil raised Iraq. I know that you also were engaged from uh, a different angle, but could you describe uh, as well the legal uh, underpinning here and the precedents for, for this action? Yes, I'm happy to, Paula. And uh, I'll, I'll try to focus a little bit more on the, the legal issue um, mm -hmm. that, that you raised in your question. Um, 
and, and it's not hard for me to do that because back 30 years ago when Phil was on the NSC staff working the Iraq issue, I was his lawyer. So I was a lawyer at the White House on, on the NSC staff at the same time. Um, the, uh, Phil is right there. If you want to talk about the legal basis for confiscating uh, Russian sovereign assets, there, there's an issue of domestic law, which we can talk about. I personally believe that we do, we are, at least as a practical matter, we're going to need legislation in order for that to happen. Um, the good news is that there's a lot of interest uh, in, in the U.S. Congress in enacting such legislation. So um, it's, it's that part of the problem is eminently solvable. Um, the, the, the more difficult, more challenging question is what is the international, the international legal basis, or I should say the, the basis under international law for doing this. And uh, I'll address most of my comments to that. Uh, let, let me begin by just reading the, the basically the, the legal definition, the law, the law dictionary definition of, uh, of uh, customary international law, because I, I think it's important to bear that in mind when we talk about what is the international law. Uh, I'll read two sort of standard definitions of customary international law. One is that it's the general principles of law recognized by civilized nations. Uh, another dictionary definition, the general and consistent practice of states that they follow from a sense of legal obligation. Um, so it's, it's not like the U.S. Constitution that it's, that it's written down. It's customary international law is basically the practice of, of civilized states. And um, it's quite clear, you know, practice of civilized states varies over time. It adapts. Uh, in the face of new threats, new problems, uh, new challenges that, that the world faces. Uh, so you know, we have a, a debate all the time about, you know, is the Const U.S. Constitution a living document? Can its meaning change over time? Um, you can argue that both ways. Uh, when it comes to customary international law, there, there's no debate. Uh, international law evolves. It's meant to evolve. And uh, when, 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 you know, when there's a new challenge, you, it's predictable that, that international law may have to evolve. To address it, and and the way it evolves is when there's when the civilized nations, the international consensus about what is appropriate behavior, changes, then you create a new customary international law. Um, my takeaway from that is that we are entitled, you know, from a legal perspective, we're entitled when approaching this problem to be creative and flexible. Uh, we don't need to be rigid and hidebound. Um, we, we, we're facing. I mean, this is a colossal problem presented in Ukraine. We've got a permanent member of the UN Security Council committing aggression and not sort of old fashioned, you know, border dispute, we're gonna fight, fight you over it. You know, this is like medieval imperial aggression. You know, we, we, we reject the independence of the country next to us and we plan to conquer them and make them part of our country. And that's, this is old fashioned aggression of a kind we haven't seen in, in you know, well, at least since World War II. Uh, and it's being com committed by a, a permanent member of the Security Council. And so ad addressing that requires us to be a little bit uh, flexible and, and creative uh, in, in uh, the options that we consider. Now, I don't think we have to invent international law uh, to, to do this. Um, there, there are people, though, that, that ask the question, well, where, if you can't give me an exact precedent for doing what you're proposing to do, then it's illegal. Uh, you know, my, my point is that's, that's a rigid inflexible approach that's inappropriate uh, in, in the context of the problem we're facing. Um, the, uh, I, I agree with Phil that among the theories that have been put forward about what's, what's, what's the strongest international legal theory for uh, confiscating the Russian assets and making them available for, for Ukraine and, and claimants in Ukraine, uh, the, the doctrine of countermeasures uh, seems to be the, the, the strongest available theory. And uh, Phil is correct that when, when you're proceeding under that theory, uh, you are by definition departing from the ordinary rules of, of customary international law. You are departing to the degree necessary to encourage another country that is not also not compliant with its obligations to come back into compliance. And, and so international law recognizes that there are times when that's appropriate. The nice thing for our purposes about uh, this doctrine is that, it, that it's, uh, it's a collective right. It's not just an individual right. So it's like the right of self-defense under the UN Charter. It's an individual and collective right. 
uh, if a country is attacked, it can defend itself, but its friends can come and help it defend itself. And the, the same is true of countermeasures. Uh, other countries that are affected are entitled to, to adopt countermeasures as well as the country that's most immediately impacted. And so, so the United States and our G7 allies are entitled to invoke the doctrine of countermeasures in, in this instance. There are limitations on countermeasures, um, but as Phil said, I, I think uh, they are either already satisfied or, or easily satisfied uh, with uh, a, a, a thoughtful, uh, appropriately adapted approach to the problem. Uh, what are the limitations? Well, the, the response has to be proportionate. So, um, argue about it, what exactly that means, but I don't think there. Are, we, we all agree that. I don't think there's any dispute that Russia has committed aggression. There's an ICJ ruling, there's a UN General Assembly resolution. Um, there are a variety of, uh, of legal decisions that we can point to uh, to establish that fact. Uh, and one of the implications of, of that is that there is liability. The Iraq precedent, I, I, I can discuss that at greater length, but the UN Security Council found after the Iraq war that, that Iraq was liable to Kuwait for the damage that had inflicted uh, uh, as a result of its uh, as a result of its aggression, and let's be clear, it did not create that liability. It didn't say you are liable because we are determining that you're, we're, we're ordering you to be liable. It, it, it just asserted the Security Council asserted that under international law, obviously, a country that commits illegal aggression and inflicts damage on another country is liable for the damage, and the same is true here. Um, so. In adopting um, uh, measures in response to that, uh, we need to be proportionate. Uh, we don't know the full extent of the liability that Russia has to Ukraine, but it's going to be greater than the Russian assets that we're talking about. Uh, the Russian assets, uh, the standard numbers are 30 billion in the US, 300 billion worldwide. I, I've yet to see a number about the cost of reconstructing Ukraine that's under $300 billion, uh, and, and, it, and it grows by the day. So, um, I think by definition, we're, we're, whatever measures we adopt here are going to be proportionate to the, the amount of, of Russia's liability. Uh, there is a requirement to try and negotiate a solution before you uh, adopt your countermeasures. Um, I, I think we might wanna take some additional steps to make sure that we check that box, uh, but I'll be surprised if Russia's prepared to, to negotiate uh, um, something that would, would lead us not to want to adopt uh, the confiscation of their assets as a countermeasure. And then finally, and, and those who those who have disagreed with, with Phil's writings on this subject um, point mostly to this final um, uh, limitation, and that is that the countermeasures need to be reversible so that once the country whose violation of its international legal obligations um, comes back into compliance with its obligations, you need to be able to reverse your countermeasures. And, uh, critics have said, well, that's the problem here because once you invest the, or once you confiscate the Russian assets, um, you can't give them back to Russia. And so this is not a reversible countermeasure and therefore it, it doesn't qualify as a countermeasure. Well, I, I think that's, that argument uh, is, is looking at the problem too narrowly. Um, the Russia, Russia's violation of international law is not just that it's committing aggression. It's that it's committing aggression and failing to pay compensation. And until it does both of those things, um, the entitlement to, to um, apply countermeasures will exist. And it would only be in an instance where Russia fully satisfied its obligation to pay compensation to Ukraine that this reversibility issue would become an issue. But if, if I, I, I'm gonna make up numbers here, if, if in the end, Russia's liability is determined to be $800 billion and uh, we've, you know, the G7 countries have collectively confiscated $300 billion in Russian assets and given that to Ukraine and the Ukrainian claimants, um, if Russia at that point comes in and writes an $800 billion check to Ukraine, then under, this, under the reversibility concept, we need to figure out a way to give Russia the $300 billion back. That, that were confiscated. But if they've written a check to Ukraine for 800 billion, which you know, with the 300 billion we've given them means that they've received 1.1 trillion, they should be able to afford to give us the 300, the G7, the 300 billion back so that we can reimburse Russia. Don't think it'll ever play out that way, but 
it, it, I, I dispute the notion that this is not reversible if Russia actually fulfills its international legal obligations. Maybe I'll stop there right. and we can talk uh, about it. Because right I'm, I'm hoping, let's get another round. If you guys don't mind, I'm going to come around to each of you. So Phil, hold that thought if you don't mind, uh, because then I do want to open it up for questions from here or from online. But let me, Larry, may I go back to you on a different question? You know, one other big criticism of this uh, uh, concept is, oh, it's going to harm the U.S. dollar. U.S. former Secretary of Treasury, could you address that? Because you know that keeps coming up in this context. And then address any other part that you've heard from Phil and or, or and or Steve at this time. So a a remark, a question, and then an answer. Um, the remark is that I'm guessing there's a fair amount of legal talent listening to this uh, panel, and this is a very hot issue currently uh, in flux. When I was a senior policy authority who wanted to do things, who was getting static from my lawyers, it was enormously valuable for distinguished people on the outside or even creative, but not yet distinguished people on the outside to be advancing um, arguments. And so to the extent that anybody out here, out there has the capacity to generate legal memoranda supporting the arguments that you have uh, seen or advancing theories of your own in support of this conclusion, you would be providing a very valuable service uh, by uh, doing that. So anybody who's looking for paper topics, looking for activities, this is a very valuable area, it seems to me, for uh, legal research and legal argumentation. Second uh, question for probably Steve, but possibly uh, Phil. I have heard the argument advanced whenever the Iraq war precedent is brought to bear that we acknowledged very explicitly and very clearly that we were at war with Iraq in defense of Kuwait, but that uh, we are at great pains to say that we are assisting Ukraine, but that we are not at war with Russia. And therefore that the kinds of actions taken with respect to Iraq are not relevant precedent in the context of a non-war uh, with uh, Russia. I, I think it would be helpful to have on the record here a reaction to that claim, since I think it is one that is fairly uh, uh, fairly pervasive. Look, uh, with respect to um, the dollar, the argument comes in um, comes in different uh, forms. But I guess I would say these things. First, history teaches that countries lose their reserve currency status because they lose their superpower status. That's how the Dutch lost it for the guilder. That's how the British lost it for their pound. So to the extent that we are permitting international anarchy to carry the day and aggression to carry the day, I would argue that that is undermining the uh, strength of uh, the dollar. Second, what is it that people are worried about exactly? It's not that we are holding rubles and renminbi in any meaningful quantity that are going to be seized uh, to their detriment. Third, what are people who wish to avoid this going to do to hold uh, their assets. What's contemplated here is a multilateral action of the major uh, countries and major currencies, including the dollar, euro, yen, uh, British, uh, British, British pound. It is hard for me to imagine in light of the, shall we say, um, erratic and ungenerous character of much of what the Chinese have done, 
in recent years that people will decide that holding their assets in forms that make them highly vulnerable to Chinese action will improve uh, their position. And last thing I would say is that I think these concerns are highly uh, cabined. They're highly cabined in the sense that if any country that thinks that it's likely to launch a war of a kind that represents aggression where its president will be declared a war criminal, decides not to hold dollar assets, that seems to me to be a cost uh, that we are likely uh, to be able to uh, live with uh, quite, uh, e quite easily. And the last thing I would say is Russia's assets are immobilized at this point. I don't think anybody believes that those assets are going to be available to the Russian state any time in the foreseeable uh, future. So whatever cost there is, we have already paid it with the action that we have already taken by immobilizing uh, those uh, assets. So I find this to be a uh, not plausible uh, line of argument against the proposed policy. All right, well, Larry, thank you. Before I go to you, Phil, one quick, quick one for Larry. I think that both of you in the article and with Bob Zellick, also just to clarify, because it's come up and has been raised, uh, the issue of how the assets are dispersed in claimants. You, I think, argue that it shouldn't only be that Ukrainians, you know, are claimants, but that there may be those, I think you identify in the, the global south as well. Is that, is, that, is that the case? And just clarify your reasoning for that. As I understand uh, the relevant doctrine coming out of the Iraq case, there is a legitimate... Um, equally legitimate argument for um, providing compensations to others besides Ukraine who have been victim of Russian aggression. I would think they fall in two primary categories. They fall in those who've incurred very substantial costs because of Ukrainian refugees uh, in their countries. It may occur because those who have been cut off from food supplies or possibly from uh, energy uh, supplies. And so I don't want to prejudge exactly where the relevant tribunals would uh, come out. But and I would imagine that the substantial majority of any resources that were committed would be committed uh, for the support of Ukraine, but I believe the option should be on the table of providing support to collateral victims. All right, thank, thank you for that. And Phil, you have a number of issues to take on, but I'm also gonna ask you one specific one. You could take on a number of these as you've heard, but who, by the way, a question that also comes up all the time is, who's in charge of the process? Is it the UN? Is it the US? Is it the EU? Who, who is it that should be in charge of this process? And then take on the other issues too, and I hope you find your volume. <laughs> so um, a lot of interesting issues here. Um, first, what, uh, who are the claimants? There are, there are three categories. Uh, and in addition, then there's, it will take a long time for uh, I think the money should be transferred to escrow accounts immediately and consolidated in escrow. Then the escrow accounts, uh, some portion of that money then is simply held actually for possible diplomacy with Russia as money is distributed to the other three categories over time. The other three categories are one, needs for policy programs of Ukrainian reconstruction, which are proactive and are not based on adjudicated claims large-scale reconstruction and recovery programs, which I believe should begin immediately this year. Um, number two, 
um, claims from other injured states along the lines of the established doctrines Larry just referred to. Three, um, adjudicated claims, probably adjudicated claims that have been recognized by international courts and tribunals, of which an excellent example, for instance, are the judgments already uh, settled from Dutch courts for the shoot down of MH17, the Malaysian airliner that was shot down over the Donbass. There's an outstanding pending judgment on that involving the government of Malaysia and a lot of uh, victims, you know, and those judgments have been recognized and things like that, I think some amount of money should be set aside to address those and other similarly situated judgments. Now, let me turn then to the, so that's kind of, think about those different buckets that, uh, that can be addressed by the money that's in escrow. The second question was, what about the war argument that we were at war in the Iraq days in 1991? None of the relevant authorities or actions were based on armed conflict um, prerequisites. There is currently in the emergency powers law an armed conflict proviso. That was passed in 2001. It didn't exist in 1992. Um, nothing in the emergency powers that were used back then depended on the finding of an armed conflict or the existence of an armed conflict. We use the exact same powers we used in the Iran hostage case and in other situations. So even though, uh, and by the way, the initial UN resolution on this was passed before the armed conflict had actually began, which was, uh, so uh, I think that's a, that's a, that's a coincidence, it's not, a, it's, not a le it's not part of the legal requirements. I do wanna address the, the issue that Steve raised of, you know, gee, do you need to return the money? Because I think this is a source of a lot of confusion. The reason that European Commission lawyers don't want to touch the money is not because they think they need to return it. The reason they don't touch the money is because they're in the sanctions paradigm. This comes clear in their, in their working documents. They're in a sanctions paradigm and not a countermeasures paradigm. In the countermeasures paradigm, you suspend an international obligation. What's the international obligation here? This is really important. There is a difference between the safety deposit box in a bank and the contents of the safety deposit box. So let me just put it another, let me put it a different way. If Russian state assets enjoyed no sovereign immunity, what international obligations would pertain to them? Plaintiffs would be all over those assets tomorrow, <laughs> including starting with the MH17 judgment. So if there was no sovereign immunity there, those assets would be dispersed and there'd be a million plaintiffs standing in line, you know, as quickly as they could get to the courthouse. So the only thing that's, uh, the, the only relevant international obligation here is not the money, it's the sovereign immunity shielding the money. So that, that's the international obligation you owe to Russia. That's what's being suspended in the countermeasure. You're suspending their ordinary immunity. Once you, and then by the way, the money then gets dispersed under international law. And then once Russia comes into compliance or the money is dispersed, they can then again get sovereign immunity of their state assets. They don't get the money back. So I think it's just really important to keep these two points separate. And one final uh, issue I do want to touch on where Steve and I may have a little disagreement is that I actually don't think you need congressional action to do any of this. I actually think it's important to have congressional support for a lot of reasons. Um, I, uh, and there are some, uh, we did not have congressional, uh, um, the emergency powers that we used in 1992 did not have the armed conflict proviso we, Congress passed in 2001. This has to do with an original misunderstanding about the idea of do you need to vest control of the assets instead of just transferring them. It's a international kind of technical point. In 1992, we never vested. There was no vesting in 92 and, and we transferred them. We transferred them under the old IEPA that uh, using language that didn't have vesting authority in it. When in 1981, when we transferred the Iranian assets to the to a British to a foreign British escrow account, we used old IEPA to do that. 
no armed conflict involved, no armed conflict proviso, no vesting. Because the U United States never vested property ownership of the assets in the United States government, which would have all kinds of implications. Instead, it simply transferred them to an escrow account and then dealt with the fate of the funds in the escrow account purely under international law and pursuant to international agreements, including in the 81 case, diplomacy with Iran. Uh, um, but I'm, I'm in favor of having Congress on board in some way. I think, by the way, it's, it's in the interest of the executive branch that they not take a position that requires congressional action because there's a danger here that Congress may see a piece of legislation like this as a Christmas tree. And I think the executive needs to have the option, um, if a lot of people start rushing to the tree for gifts, to say, well, actually, I'm, we're not actually under, Zellico says we don't need legislation, and in fact, we didn't need it in the past. The IEPA authorities we've already invoked are good enough. Let me, if I, if I may, before I go to you, Steve, uh, we have a, a little bit uh, under 15 minutes. And Larry, I wanna be respectful of your time. I, uh, let me just ask you, is it still the case you had to leave a little bit early? Is that, is yes, that the is. case? Yes. Yes, it is. Okay, I apologize. Well, I apologize for, for that, but I think I've had a good say here. So I um, don't feel a need <laughs> to add anything unless there's anything that somebody feels a need to hear me talk about. Yeah. No, well, we'll I'll, I'll, let, I'll let it sit, but you might want to, I'm just going to give Steve a chance to respond to this question about legislation. Yes. As a lawyer, because your appeal about lawyers taking this on, he has taken this on, and the, the issue that Phil raised actually was going to be my question. You have a number of points you might want to respond to that you've heard, but he has been working with Congress on uh, Senator Risha's uh, legislation. And by the way, it's worth noting Canada already, its parliament did pass legislation, you know, uh, in support of the seizure of Russian assets. So maybe to start with that and then work backwards, would you like to take that on? Why is it important for Congress? And then there were several other points that were registered. If you do it succinctly, you could do it while Larry is also on. And then we're gonna open it up for, for uh, uh, questions. Okay, well, first, uh, Phil, like I very much want this to happen. So if, if there's a way to do it under existing law, I'm, I'm, I'm existing US statutory law, I'm all in favor of that happening. Um, I guess I'm pretty well satisfied from the research I've done on this and the conversations I've had that there you have exactly zero chance of persuading the lawyers at the departments of state, treasury and justice, who are the people who are advising Biden administration on this, uh, that they, don't, they have existing authority. Uh, oh, let me give you some good authority. news. Don't give up hope on that. That situation is moving. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, will, I will say, you know, there, there is a difference between transferring funds and changing title to those funds upon the transfer. And the precedents you cite about, there have been times when the funds have been transferred or consolidated. I mean, that's true, but I, I think you'd be hard pressed to find examples where the title to the funds uh, changed as part of the transfer. Um, and I, I think you, you find that that's what lawyers in the executive branch uh, find problematic about some of the arguments you've made. Um, the, um, I, I did want to, I, I like your Christmas tree point uh, about legislation though, and, and, and I want to take that back to something Larry said earlier, which was uh, he thinks uh, we, we ought to be open to making I think we believe it's about $30 billion in, in uh, immobilized Russian assets in the United States, making some of that money available, not only to Ukrainian claimants, but um, I, I think uh, collateral victims was, was uh, uh, Larry's term, including uh, the, the, the Global South and, and you know, maybe other people with claims, you know, refugees. And, uh, I'm, I'm hearing refugees. jingle bells. Yeah. Um, I, I just want to say, and this is, I'm directing myself to Larry here, I, I think that is a very dangerous idea, Larry, because uh, if, if Congress gets into the business of legislating on this uh, and word gets out that there's a $30 billion pie and uh, it's starting to be sliced up and you know the global south is getting a slice and countries housing refugees are getting a slice, uh, there's going to be a line out the door of other people who come forward with very worthy claims about why they should get a slice. And, let me just say, some of those people 
are going to have a lot more political appeal to members of Congress than the global south. Um, you know, I'll give you an example. Uh, U.S. victims of state-sponsored terrorism. Uh, there is a fund in the Treasury Department that it's called the Victims of State-Sponsored Terrorism Fund. Uh, it's chronically underfunded, but 9-11 victims have claims they're trying to get satisfied out of that fund. Uh, you know, anybody who claims that they were killed as a result or injured as a result of state-sponsored terrorism wants money out of that fund. There's not enough money there. Congress, they're already talking in Congress about, well, maybe you know, 30 billion, we don't need all of it. We can, you know, just a piece of it for the, and I think if you followed what happened with the Panama 103 victims, what happened with the, uh, the, um, the, the, the Saudi Arabia focused legislation, uh, JASTA, um, victims of terrorism uh, have a lot of friends in the United States Congress. Uh, so, you know, I think they get in line ahead of the global South if, if Congress gets a say in the matter. And um, I, I think a decision needs to be made at the very outset. Is this money for Ukraine and Ukrainian claimants only? Are we going to open it up to everybody who's got a claim against Russia um, or a claim against terrorism or you know, some other claim that, that's underfunded? And um, if we do that, I'm not sure how much money is actually going to be left for, for Ukraine in the end. Because, Phil, I, I know you've got arguments and you believe in them, but I personally believe that the only way this is ever going to happen is if Congress passes legislation. And when Congress passes legislation, it's going to get to shape how the money is to be expended. And if we signal that there are lots of people who can get a piece of the pie. Um, I guess this Congress is going to have trouble saying no to some of them. Larry, yeah. just a parting shot, because uh, forgive me, because I know you said you had to jump off. I thought Phil and Steve will take, uh, we're going to see if we have a few questions from here. But do you have a closing comment, Larry? Only that, uh, my only closing comment is, uh, are two. Uh, I think it is important to move this forward and it is much more important to move this forward than it is to move it forward in precisely the right way, according to uh, me. And I don't, uh, I think it would be desirable, and I think there is a strong moral case for there being third parties beyond Ukraine. But if in the political dynamic, that is setting off an impossible slippery slope. I could be comfortable with it being only for Ukraine. The other thing, uh, only other thing I would say is that I think in thinking about engagement with Congress, it is important to think ahead. That is saying we're going to go to Congress because we think we should. It's harder to say, well, Congress said no, but we're going to go ahead anyway after you put the question to Congress than it is when you decided you didn't need to put the question to Congress. And there are some contexts where Congress prefers to not have the question uh, put to it. Those who've studied the history of the involvement in the Mexican bailout that I was very much involved in will be able to fill in the blanks uh, here. So I, and I don't have views on the politics and legalisms of going to Congress or not. But I think if you go to Congress, it will get considerably harder to say that you didn't have to go to Congress when Congress says no. Thank you, everyone, for you. allowing me to be a part of this. Uh, thank you very much, Phil, if you'll still stay with us. Larry, thank you. So let's, if, if you don't mind, Steve and Phil, let's just see if here, uh, I don't know if we have any online, but here in this room, um, lawyers, others, um, questions, comments. Yes, we have, uh, we have two right here. Why don't we take both of yours? Go ahead. If you don't mind standing up, I'm just thinking which way should she be directed so he could see her? Um, I think you're up. I think it's. It's, 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 it's that way. The, the that. camera's right there. So the camera's right there. What? Stand right here. Please stand right here and go ahead. And if you'll introduce yourself. <laughs> yes, sorry for that. Um, my name is Svetlana. I'm actually from business school and I'm from Ukraine. And first of all, I absolutely delighted that we have this conversation. I totally agree that economic aspects of the ongoing war are extremely important. And it's great for us to have such powerful and competent voices on our side. 
Uh, the question I have is quite simple and not simple. It's about the time frame of the solutions that you are offering. Because we honestly, we need this money yesterday, but based on what you say, it sounds like, of course, it's an extremely complicated decision. And the bad thing about international law is that it's never fast. So what's your realistic and maybe optimistic estimate of when uh, this Russian assets or maybe a portion of them can be like, transferred or provided to Ukraine? Thank you. And Phil and Steve, if you don't mind, uh, let's get the other question. Uh, if you don't mind, same thing. And you know the camera's right there. So if you'll introduce yourself, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Abduan. I'm a fellow at the HKS and the Weather Center. I'm a career diplomat of Korea. So, and personally, I talked with Robert, Professor Robert Jolly about this issue. So I'm very interested in this, this issue. Also with this, your, I read a few, a lot of your papers, Professor. So I'm also very interested in your ideas. So as we talk in this conversation, the uh, and transfer of uh, Russian assets itself has a lot of domestic objections and also international obstacles. So uh, I'm sure you also thought of other plans. So is there any other effective or efficient monetary terms to help rebuild Ukraine? Because if it doesn't work, we still need to rebuild and reconstruct Ukraine and help them. So is there any other monetary aid or assistance you thought of, which could help Ukraine. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you both. Uh, Phil, why don't we go to you first and then to sure. Steve. Um, the Ukrainian question about time is a great question. As Paula knows, I first published a piece in Foreign Affairs advocating this a year ago, along with an MIT professor, economist named Simon Johnson. Now you see I've enlisted more powerful economists. <laughs> but, but so this is this is already delayed way too long. The good news is um, uh, I actually, uh, I think Steve made a good point that kind of says, you know, there's a, there are advantages to running a, con a, a congressional line here in parallel with possible executive move, kind of in case you, you get stymied in one of them. Um, I think that's a, um, a good political strategy because the essence here is speed. What can be done fastest? Um, and, and my actually the international financial institutions are coming to Washington for their spring meeting in a couple of weeks. I think the United States can have its move ready and announced by then. I think money could be literally be transferred into escrow accounts in one week after that. By the way, uh, the large majority, almost all the money is in Europe and most of the money in Europe has already been located and could be uh, transferred very quickly. Then you get into a matter of developing operational plans to actually execute budgets. But here's what would happen right away. Right away, you would give the Ukrainian people and companies a message of hope that money has actually been located to promise that Ukraine can be built back better. And then I think during the course of 2023, billions of euro can be invested, which in the scale and context of the Ukrainian economy is actually a lot of money and could make a big difference, um, so, um, especially as other sources of funds begin to tap out, which then leads me to the question from um, our good friend from South Korea, which is, suppose you can't get the Russian assets, what's the, what's the fallback? Right now, we are the United States is spending on the in the vicinity of two billion dollars a month in cash transfers to the Ukrainian government just so it can pay its monthly bills. This is the equivalent of a patient in the ER on a gurney bleeding to death who is getting an IV keeping the patient alive before the patient can even be transferred to a room to be treated. We haven't even begun a serious recovery and reconstruction program yet for Ukraine. We are spending billions a month just to keep the patient alive. That's how serious the situation is. The Russians know it, and they are exploiting it every week with their missile strikes. So we've got to get moving on this. And I'll just tell you the hard news is um, a lot of people have plans and ideas about what can be done. They don't have the money. Uh, I believe the current level of cash transfers is not sustainable. I think maybe it can be sustained for another, you can argue, six, nine, 12 months. I don't think it's indefinitely sustainable. 
Uh, there are already a lot of people in Congress who are opposing it now. Like I heard a congressman literally last week complaining to Tony Blinken about why are we giving money to Ukrainian pensioners? So that's only going to get worse. We're going to have our debt crisis in a couple of months. The European, and you can look at what European taxpayers are willing to do in, in the midst of all the pressures on them. So the bad news is if you don't, if we don't find a fallback on this, I don't see a good fallback. Um, and then uh, what can happen is a situation later this year in which the Ukrainian people are bleeding, exhausted, struggling, and no one is really offering them a convincing strategy of hope with a third of their population already displaced. And uh, I don't like that picture. And so that's why I think this issue is so important. Thank you, uh, Steve. Uh, two uh, questions here. If you'll give a quick response, and we're going to wrap. Uh, first, I, I just want to quickly go back to the conversation we were having earlier about other claimants and, and rewarding them out of the blocked assets. Um, just to make the observation that you know, we, we do actually have to try very hard to construct a persuasive rationale under international law to provide these blocked Russian assets to a country that is the victim of aggression, uh, whose infrastructure is being destroyed, whose innocent civilians are being killed, uh, whose population is subject to war crimes in the opinion of the International Criminal Court. And it's still hard to construct a persuasive international law rationale for making these assets available to them. The argument becomes even harder if you're gonna talk about countries having to support refugees, if you're gonna talk about the global South, other claimants. So it's just an additional thing to keep in mind about you know, do, is this money ultimately for Ukraine or is it for everybody who's, who's experienced hardship? Um, on the questions, maybe I'll, I'll turn to the second one. Um, look, I, I think it's absolutely correct question, the right question to ask. Um, and, and like, even if we manage to confiscate all $300 billion in blocked Russian assets that we think are out there, that's still not going to be enough to reconstruct Ukraine and to provide the, the compensation. That Russia owes. So we're going to confront the question you ask, even if we succeed in investing all those assets. So you know, it's it's something we really ought to think about. Um, you know, what the the answer that you get from most quarters is, well, I guess the tax, you know, Western taxpayers are going to have to pay because you know, Russia is not going to be good for it, and and you know, where else is the money going to come from? I I, I guess I would want to see. I, I do want to suggest one one idea that um, I believe ought to be looked at. Um, and for this, I go back to the Iraq precedent uh, and what the United Nations Security Council did uh, after Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. Um, it found that Iraq owed money to, train, or, I mean, to Kuwait for compensation, and it set up a compensation fund. And that fund was filled with essentially a tax on Iraqi oil exports. And for about the next decade, 30% of Iraqi oil export revenue went straight to the UN fund. And that was distributed to American claimants. Later, that percentage diminished. In the end, it was 5%. Um, but that, that program of basically taxing Iraqi oil exports and giving the money to Kuwaiti claimants, you know when that ended? Last year. Okay? 30 years that program existed and was funded with Iraqi oil money. Guess what? Russia exports oil and gas. Um, Taxing their export revenue for the next 30 years uh, is something we ought to think about. Um, it, it's a source of revenue. Um, and there's the Iraqi president. The difference, of course, is in the case of Iraq, it was imposed by the UN Security Council. A little bit harder with Russia because Russia could veto doing this at the UN Security Council. Um, some people think the UN General Assembly can overcome that. Uh, again, I think that's kind of a hard sell. One idea encourage people to think about this. Um, so the G7 countries decided they didn't want to drive Russian oil off the global market, but they wanted to limit the revenue that Russia got. So they imposed a, a sanctions policy to, look, to limit the price at which Russian oil can be sold. Oil price cap. And it, it's enforced through sanctions. Ideally, that would be the UN Security Council imposing a price cap. But again, the Russian veto, not, not something even worth talking about. Uh, so they, they, the G7 countries have done this through the sanctions policy. Someone ought to look at whether sanctions could be used in a similar way 
to compel those who, for the next 30 years or however long it takes, import Russian oil and gas, compel them to pay, instead of paying all the money to Russia, to pay some percentage of it into a compensation fund. Could the sanctions tool that we're using to enforce the Russian oil price cap be deployed in a slightly more creative, and I'll admit unprecedented way to compel buyers of, of those petroleum products to pay money into a compensation fund for Ukraine? It would be a way of bypassing circumventing the problem we have at the UN Security Council, but that, that is exactly what we're doing with the oil price cap. I mean, essentially, the G7 and the Russia price cap is an effort to circumvent um, our inability to, to get the UN Security Council to impose such, such a cap. Steve, interesting, interesting uh, proposal. Thank you for putting it forward. Steve Rademacher, Dr. Phil Zellico, thank you so much. Uh, no, really, it was just an amazing exchange today and uh, just really thank you both uh, for you coming virtually for you being here in person um, so please join me in uh, giving <laughs>